السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وی ار ریئلی لکی الحمد للہ دیٹ آور ڈاکٹر ذاکر کریم صاحب از ہیئر ان مدراس بٹ سنس دا کوشچن اینڈ آنسر سیشن از دیر آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو جسٹ پٹ فورتھ بفور ہیم دا کوشچنس ہیو بین آسک ٹو می بائی نان مسلمس ویری آفن بٹ آئی ایم اسٹل ناٹ ایبل ٹو آنسر ٹو دیم ان اے کریکٹ پرسپیکٹو مین ڈاکٹر صاحب It is our firm belief that the believers will go to Jannah and the non-believers will go to hell. But a Hindu or a Christian often asks me that we are born in a Hindu family or we are born in a Christian family and naturally we will continue to have to follow the same religion. It is not our fault whether we will also go to hell forever or shall we also go to heaven. And second question, I used to tell them, you are supposed to read the Holy Quran and understand the religion. But another firm belief is, even a Muslim, we should not supposed to touch the Quran without wazu. We have to be wazu and then only we must read Quran. But how can a non-believer who is not a Muslim, when Muslims, we ourselves cannot touch the Quran, how can a non-believer can touch the Quran and read? That is a question I am not able to answer. Could you please answer this one? Thank you. The learned brother has asked two questions. The first one is that the non-Muslims say that according to Islam, only the believers, only the Muslims will go to Jannah. How are we to blame that as a Hindu and a Christian, if he's born in a Hindu family, a Christian family, we should blame God Almighty? Because God Almighty put us in a Christian family and a Hindu family, So how, according to Islam, isn't your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unjust that because we are born in a non-Muslim family, you will be put to hell? The answer that you can give is that according to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, every child is born in Deen al-Fit. Deen al-Fit means the innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim, irrespective whether he's born in a Hindu family, a Muslim family, a Christian family, a Parsi family or a Buddhist family. Every child is born as a Muslim. What is the meaning of the word Muslim? Muslim means one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, by the influence of his elders, the influence of his parents, influence of his teachers, our beloved Prophet said, he starts doing idol worship, he starts worshipping fire, and he goes away from Sirat al-Mustaqim and goes on the wrong track. Therefore, when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, we prefer using the word revert than the English word convert. Convert means going from one track to the other track. Revert means every human being initially is a Muslim. By the influence of other people, he goes on the wrong track. And later on, he is reverted back to the correct Sirat al-Mustaqim, that is Islam. So therefore, revert is a more appropriate word for a non-Muslim who becomes a Muslim than the English word convert. So every child is born in Deen al -Fit. If you ask, what proof do you have today? There was a research done on two tribes, the Kapauku tribe and the tribe of Australian aborigines. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. When the researchers went and tried to find out the way of life, they were following Islam in everything except in name. They believed there was one God, they believed he was almighty, he was omnipresent, he was omnipotent, he did not beget, nor was he begotten. They did the sujood when they prayed to this God Almighty. They were following Islam, everything but in name. They didn't call themselves Muslim. But indeed, they were Muslim. So if we do an experiment today, that if you take a child from a Hindu family, one from a Christian family, one from a Buddhist family, the moment the child is born, isolate him from the other human beings. Let him come up absolutely without in contact with any other human being. Isolate him and let him grow up. See to it he gets food but does not come in contact with any other human being. After he grows up, if you try and learn his philosophy, it will be everything of Islam but in name. Because this is the innate religion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in every human being the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of Islam. And Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 172 and 173, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the human beings came in this world, He bought the children of Adam from the loins. 
And he asked all the human beings before they came in this world, they were asked, the souls were asked, that do you believe there is one God? And all of them testified, yes, we believe there is only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, the memory was washed and they have come into this world. It is their duty to find the truth. But even if they don't find the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it upon himself to deliver the message of Islam. It's the duty of Muslims to dawa. But in spite of that, Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, He says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afakhi, bafi anfutihim, hatta yatabayyana lahum anna ul haq. That soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizon and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Allah takes it up upon Himself that in every individual soul, besides showing His signs in the horizon, the sun, the moon, the trees, etc., He will even make it clear into their soul that this is the truth. But later on, after accepting the truth, many people. They agree with it, but they don't accept it because if they accept it, if they become Muslims, they may go lost in business. They may lose their friends. So for material gain, they do not accept the truth. They agree with it, but they don't accept it. And Allah says very clearly that by the age of 40, every human being will agree that there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least once in the lifetime. So the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given to every human being and every human being is born as a Muslim, later on he goes to the wrong track. Regarding that will Muslim go to Jannah. Only by saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you do not get a ticket to heaven. There are many Muslims who feel that only by saying the Shahada, you go to Jannah. The criteria for going to Jannah is mentioned, as I said in my talk, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, we say, Wal as inna al-insana la that by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to patience and perseverance, those who exhort people to truth, that is to Dawa and Islam. These are the minimum four criteria for a person to go to Jannah. If any one of these four criteria is missing, according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a good Muslim, you may have Iman, you may be offering the Salah, you may have gone for Hajj, but if you don't do Dawah, if you don't deliver the message, you shall not enter Jannah. All four criteria are required for a person to enter Jannah. Not only saying the Shahada. The person should have belief, should have righteous deeds, that is, should be honest, etc. Should invite people to truth, do Dawah, and invite people to patience and perseverance. Only being born in a Muslim family will not transfer to Jannah. Hope this answers the first question. Regarding the second question, that Muslims are supposed to do wudu and touch the Quran, how will the non-Muslim read the Quran? And normally, I will be dealing with this topic in detail tomorrow, inshallah, in the morning. Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding, I will be dealing with the subject in detail. But just to answer briefly, what the Muslims refer to the verse in the Holy Quran from Surah Waqia, chapter number 56, verse number 77 to 80, which says that Quran is most honorable, a book well guarded, which none shall touch except those who are pure, except those who are clean. Here when the Holy Quran says none shall touch it, it does not mean physical touching. Any non-Muslim, they can easily take a Holy Quran and touch it and the Quran will be proved wrong. They can purchase a copy of the Holy Quran for 100 rupees or 200 rupees and they can touch it, the Quran will be proved wrong. When the Quran says none will be able to touch it, touch here does not mean physical touch. It means no one will be able to understand the Quran, will be able to derive the benefit of the Quran, will be able to assimilate the Quran, except those who are clean. Cleanliness does not mean body cleanliness. It means cleanliness besides of the body. It also means cleanliness of the heart, of the soul and of the mind. Touching the Quran without wudu also you can't touch the Quran. It's not a fard, the wudu should be there. You should not be najis in ceremonial impurity. Cleanliness here means you should not be in ceremonial impurities. That's for the Muslim to believe in the Quran. Otherwise, even without wudu you can touch the Quran. It's preferable to be in wudu. It's not a fard. But you cannot be in ceremonial impurity. So you may pose the question. 
that these non-Muslims, these kafir, these mushrik, they are najis. How can they touch the Quran? See, the Holy Quran is not meant only for the Muslims. It was meant for the whole of humankind. It's mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. In Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. And Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 33, verse number 41. That the Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. It was not only revealed for the Muslims or the Arabs, but for the whole of humankind. And a prophet, as I mentioned, was sent for the whole of humankind, not only for the Muslims. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible for giving the copy of the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims, I will be in good company. Because even a beloved prophet, he dictated letters in which verses of the Quran were mentioned. He gave to the non-Muslim kings. And one such letter is preserved in Turkey in the Koptaki Museum, which says, and it quotes one of the ayahs of the Holy Quran, which says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul ya hel al-Kitab, O people of the book, ta'ala wila kalmit in sawa'im, bainana bainakum. That come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate no partners with him. Shayyam wala yat sakhiza baazun abazan arbaban minun illah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say we bear witness. We are not muslimun. That we are muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Holy Quran was dictated by a beloved prophet and sent to non-Muslim kings. Some accepted Islam while the others tore that letter and trampled it beneath their feet. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible, I will be in the company of a beloved prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When he can give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims, why can't I give? People say, no, you should give only the translation, not the Arabic portion. I am asking, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. The Arabs... Arabic is a mother tongue, but they are Christians from birth. Means they were born in a Christian family. By birth they were Muslims, but they were born in a Christian family. Which translation of the Quran will you give to these Christian Arabs? You have to give the original Quran. So very well, you can give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims. Even if they make a mistake of touching the Quran, it's a minor mistake. What we have to prevent them from doing is the biggest mistake of shirk. The Holy Quran says, Come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate no partners with him. We are preventing the non-Muslim from doing the biggest sin of shirk. These small sins don't carry any weight in front of shirk. So this is the teaching of the Holy Quran and the teaching of a beloved prophet. You can and you should give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslim so that they will have no excuse on the day of judgment saying that we did not get the message of Islam. If you have a non-Muslim neighbor and he's a mushrik, if you do not deliver the message to him and on the day of judgment, Allah will question him that why didn't you accept Islam? He said, I didn't get the message. Allah says it was your job to get the message, I gave it to you. You go to hell. Allah will pose you the question, why didn't you deliver the message to your non-Muslim friend? Did you deliver the message? And if you say, I have not delivered the message, even you will follow him. Even you will go to Jahannam. I hope that answers the question. Well, brother, most welcome. First, we'll entertain the question from the mic. And inshallah, if time permits, we'll entertain the question from the slip. If there's any question on sister side, I believe they can write it on the on a slip and send it forward. How to impress upon the non-believer of the holy book, the holy prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who are themselves are not reading their holy scripture, they don't know what is Gita, they don't know what is Pranas, they accept the praise of the Lord Krishna by stealing of butter or uh, fluting the bugle or anything. How we have to be a mobile like you, to impress upon a non-believer to accept the holy Quran belief into the entire system of the universe, the faith of the people, and by ending it with Fatmul Muslim. If I hope if I am not wrong in my question. Do you understand it? The question posed by the brother was that the Hindus, they don't themselves read the Gita. They don't know much about their own holy scriptures. They only know about Krishna, etc. So how do we do dawah with them? What do we have to tell them? That you have to ask them, as the Quran says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im, bainana bainakum. 
that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we are associated with partners with Him. The Holy Quran says the best way of doing dawah is to say Allah na'buda illallah. If they quote about Krishna, you have to say, Dear brother, my Hindu friend, where do you come to know about Krishna? So he will say, In Mahabharat, in Bhagavad Gita. Let him do the job. Bhagavad Gita is one of the holy scriptures of the Hindus. So you have to say, since you believe in Bhagavad Gita and you quote Krishna, Bhagavad Gita also says in chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 23, it says, All those who do idol worship, they are materialistic people. And those who do idol worship, they are materialistic people. They say, when they speak about Krishna and other lords, they say, we come to know about these things from the Vedas. So I gave a talk quoting from the Vedas that if you say you believe in Lord Krishna because it's mentioned in Mahabharat, in Gita, you believe in certain Lord Ram because you believe in Ramayan, because you believe in the Vedas, etc. So if you believe in parts of Vedas, you have to believe as a whole. Your Vedas even prophesize the advent of a beloved prophet. And I gave quotation from Atharva Ved, from Rig Ved, from Sam Ved about the prophecy of beloved prophet. You can even speak to them, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi, that we associate no partners with him. You have to tell them, it's mentioned in your Ved, in the Rig Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. It says, na tasya pratima asti, of that God no image can be made. It's a Sanskrit quotation. In the same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, it says that God is imageless and bodiless. Same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, all those who worship the Asambhuti, that means the natural things like water, earth, air, they are in darkness. And the verse continues in Sanskrit. Andhatma pravishanti ya Asambhuti mupaste. They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the created things, the Asambhuti, a like table, chair, idol, etc. Who says that? Don't talk about the Quran. Your scripture says that. Your scripture also says, Ekam Braham Dustya Naste. Niya Naste Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai. Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So you have to say, Tala Vila Kalmit in Sawa in Baina Baina Kum. That come to come in terms as between us and you. If they don't know their scriptures, you memorize certain verses of their scriptures which match with the Holy Quran. Because the Quran is the Purkan. We don't agree that their scripture is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scripture that they have, the Veda, we don't agree it is totally the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By name, we know four revelations. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Purkan. But the Holy Quran also says in other places, in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 38, it says, that we have sent a revelation to every nation. Several revelations were sent down. By name we know four. So Veda, if a Hindu asks, is it a revelation of God Almighty? I say, I don't know. It may be. But even if it is a revelation of God Almighty, it was only meant for that time. Today you have to believe in last and final revelation that is the Holy Quran, not in a revelation which was time bound. Even if it was, I can't say for sure. I'm not saying it's the word of God. But we can use the Qur'an. Qur'an is the Furqan, the criteria to judge right from wrong. You can use the criteria to know that so there are certain parts in the Bible which match the Qur'an, which we say, this part of the Bible, we can say, may be the word of God. This part of the Veda which says that, Ya ek it mushtihi, there is only one God, worship Him alone. Rig Ved, volume number 6, chapter number 45, verse number 16, may be a word of God. But the whole Veda, we don't agree with the word of God. Hope that answers the question. We'll just take a question from the chat, Inshallah, we'll come back to you. The question is, now that you have tried to prove the advent of Prophet Muhammad through some of certain Eastern religious uh -huh, scriptures, can we presume that the majority people of India are people of the book? If yes, can we marry them without converting them? The right word is reversion, as I said as this is allowed in respect of the people of the book. The meaning of the people of the book, Ahle Kitab, Ahle Kitab means people of the book. One of the meaning of Kitab is also revelation, people of the revelation. Ahle Kitab means people of the revelation. In that way, even the Muslims are Ahle Kitab. 
But when the Quran speaks about Ahle Kitab, it is particularly referring to the people of the law and the gospel, the people of the Torah and the Injil, referring to Jews and Christians. So whenever Quran gives a reference, we have to read in context. When Quran says Ahle Kitab, it refers to no one but Jews and Christians. It does not refer to Muslims. When Quran says, Ya Ahle Kitab, Wala Taqulu Salasa, O people of the book, don't say Trinity. To Muslims say Trinity. We are Ahle Kitab. Do we say Trinity? No. So when the Quran says Ahle Kitab in context, it's referring to a particular Ahle Kitab, only Jews and Christians, not the Muslims and the other people. Regarding my second part of the question, since the prophecy of Muhammad peace be upon mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, can we say the Ahle Kitab? No, sister. As I said, we cannot say for sure that Veda is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may be. Even if it is, it is outdated. It's outdated. We have to believe in the last and final revelation that the Holy Quran and no other book today. It may be the word of God. Can we marry them? No. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, it says that do not marry unbelieving women. Do not marry unbelieving women, mushrik women, those women who do shirk, unless they believe, until they believe. Even a believing woman who is a slave woman, she is better than an unbelieving woman, a mushrik woman, even if she allows you. So Quran says, don't marry mushrik women, unless they become believers. Even a Muslim woman, a Jharuwali, who is a believer, who is a Muslim, she is better than the mushrik, even if she allows you. She may be the queen of England. She may be the most wealthiest woman in the world. She may be the most beautiful woman in the world. But yet, a Jharuwali, who is a Muslim woman, she is much better than the queen of England, even if she allows you. If she is a mushrik, a Muslim woman, a Jharuwali, is better than the queen of England if she does shirk. Similarly, for a man, the wise voice I applied, that a believing woman should not marry a mushrik man unless he believes. A jhaduwala, a Muslim jhaduwala, is much better than a mushrik, even if he allows you. He may be Princess Charles, he may be Richard Gere, the most handsome man, he may be Amitabh Bachchan. But if he does shirk, a jhaduwala, who is a Muslim, is much better than Amitabh Bachchan if he does shirk. Quran says that you are not allowed to marry mushrik. I know there's a verse in the Holy Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 5, which says, you're allowed to marry the woman of the Ahle Kitab. But you can only marry those women from the Ahle Kitab who are modest, not those who do shirk. Because Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, it says that they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, waqal al Masih, but that Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inno Mushrik Billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, Fakad Haram Allah wa Leo Jannah, Allah will make Jannah Haram for him. Wama wa Hunnar, Wama li Zolim ilmin Ansar, and fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. That means, even among the Ahle Kitab, among the Jews and Christians, there are people who do shirk. Inno mushrik billah. Anyone who associates partners with Allah, faqad haram Allah wale wal jannah. Allah will make jannah haram for him. So you cannot marry those ahle kitab women, Jews and Christians, who do shirk. You can only marry those ahle kitab who don't do shirk. And this is mentioned today, Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 110, that minhumul mu'minuna waqsamul fasikun. Among the ahle kitab, there are some who are believers, but the majority are poverty transgressors. So you can marry those Ahle Kitab women, those who don't do shirk, and those who have Iman. Hope that answers the question. But I suppose the question that there are some non-Muslims like Christians, etc., who can show about moral characters to the Muslims, etc., they are better than them. What happens to these good characters? Brother, as I mentioned, the criteria to go to Jannah are four, according to Allah, sir. One is Iman, one is righteous deed, Tawasu bil haq doing Dawah and Isla, Tawasub is sub, inviting people to patient perseverance. If they are very good in righteous deeds, suppose you are paying for an examination and there are four subjects, science, geography, history and mathematics. If you get 100 out of 100 in maths, and the other three you fail, will you overall pass? You will fail, you have to pass in all four. So even in righteous deeds if they are good, 
yet they will not enter Jannah. Similarly for a Muslim, he may have Iman, but if he doesn't have righteous deeds, he will not enter Jannah. He should have Iman, he should have righteous deeds, he should do Dawah, and he should exhort people to patience and perseverance. There are people who say that you Muslims, you Muslims, are, and, they, and they criticize. There are people who are dishonest, you don't follow this and that. You have to tell them that you have to judge the religion according to the authentic source, that is the Holy Quran and the Hadith, not by what individual Muslims do. Suppose you want to judge a car, as a Mercedes car, how good it is. If a person who does not know how to drive the car, if he sits on the steering wheel, he will bang up the car. Will you say the car is bad? No, you say the driver does not know how to drive the car. So if you have to judge Islam, judge by the authentic sources, the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, not by what Muslims do. And if you want to have an exemplary Muslim, the best example, as the Holy Quran says, is our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. The brother says, justify the, the words of the Holy Quran, Lakum dinukum wal yadin. And many Muslims quote, Lakum dinukum wal yadin. To use your way to me is mine. Therefore, you should not do dawah to the Hindu. He can be a Hindu, he can be a Christian, he can be a Parsi. All will go to Jannah. Lakum dinukum wal yadin. Brother, you are quoting out of context. You are quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Kafirun, chapter number 109, verse number 6. But you are quoting out of context. For the complete context, you have to go to the first five verses. It says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْقَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُوا مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبُدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا أَعْبُدُمْ مَا أَعْبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبُدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلْيَدِينَ Before you quote the last word, it's compulsory you should quote the first five verses, which says, Say to those who reject faith. The question of rejecting the faith only comes if you deliver the message of Islam. If you don't deliver the message of Islam, how can you say that he rejects the faith? So first you have to deliver the message of Islam to the best of your ability. Then if he does not agree with it, the last resort is, Kul ya ayyuhal kafiruna. Say to those who reject faith, I worship not that which you worship. You worship not what I worship. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor do you worship which I worship. To use your way to me is mine. Only after saying these four things, these five verses, that after delivering the message of Islam to the best of your ability, if he does not agree, Tell him, I do not worship what you worship. It's not Ram bi Khuda and Allah bi Khuda. This is hypocrisy. Some of the politicians, Muslim politicians do that. Say, call him by Allah, call him by, call him by uh, Ram, everything is fine. Where they get this from, I don't know. They are trying to scratch the back of the Hindus so that they scratch your back. Deliver the truth. And then if they don't accept it, say, I don't agree what you say, neither do you agree what I say. Lakum dinukum din. To you is your way, to me is mine. But that does not mean that I should not do dava. After doing dava, after delivering the message, the last resort, if he doesn't agree, then say, to you is your way, to me is mine. Hope that answers the question. I am uh, Professor Ahmad Basha. My question to Dr. Saab is that uh, Dr. Saab has uh, referred many things from uh, Vedas and uh, uh, Bible that uh, there, is, there are several prophecies that Prophet Salaam, the last prophet will come. Very nicely he has explained that. We are thankful to the king. My question is, Dr. Saab, whether he has discussed these prophecies with the scholars of Vedas and Bible. If he had discussed what was their interpretation for these prophecies, if they have accepted, why they have not accepted Islam? If they deny, on what basis they are denied? The brothers asked the question that have I discussed all these prophecies with the Hindu scholars and scholars of other religions, faiths, and have they accepted? I have discussed, Alhamdulillah, with several. We have discussions in our organization, in platforms, in the temples we go and discuss, Alhamdulillah. And the main concept is, Allah na Buddha illallah, <coughs> that we worship none but Allah. Have they accepted? Alhamdulillah, many have. Many have reverted to Islam, many, Alhamdulillah. Several, hundreds, Alhamdulillah. But majority don't. They agree with the truth, but as I mentioned in my talk, that they agree with the truth, but they don't accept it because of ego problems. Everyone I speak about this prophecy, everyone does not. 
Majority don't, but hundreds have, alhamdulillah. Hundreds have reverted to Islam. Why don't they accept? Because the moment you talk about this, some give excuse. No, no, these are interpolations put by Muslims afterwards. I said, these verses of the Puran are recited since thousands of years before the Muslims came to India. Where does the question arise of interpolation? They give lame excuses. They agree in their heart, deep within the heart, what the Quran says is a fact. But they don't accept it. Why? For material gain. If I become Muslim, maybe I will be excommunicated. How will I fail the society? I will go lost in business. So for their own personal reason, they don't accept it. But many do. Majority don't. Why don't they do? Allah will not ask me. Allah says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Gashiya, chapter 88, verse number 21, He tells the Prophet that your job is to deliver the message. Your job is not to reward the people. Hidat, Hidat dena Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ke hath mein. Giving Hidat in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your job is to deliver the message. Allah will not question me, why didn't he convert? Why didn't he revert? That's his problem. I delivered the message. Many do, alhamdulillah. Those who don't do, they will be held responsible on the day of judgment. Why, did, why don't they accept? Because of material gains. If he's a pundit, if he accepts Islam, what about his revenue? Will he get it? No. So we discuss with people, there are people who accept, but majority don't for their own material need. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Is it necessary to pass the message of Islam to non-Muslims? Is it duty of all Muslims or a small group? As I mentioned, it is fard for every Muslim to dawa. If they don't do dawa, they will not enter Jannah. It's fard of every Muslim to at least do part-time dawa. But the Quran says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 104, Let they arise out of you a group of people which enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong. These are the ones to attain felicity. How we are full-time doctors, full-time lawyers, full-time advocates. Why don't we have full-time dies? So there should be a group of people among the Muslims who are full-time dies. And it is the duty of the Ummah to support these dies. But otherwise, it is the duty of every Muslim to at least be part-time dies. They should do dawa. If they don't do dawa, they shall not enter Jannah. It is the belief of the Muslims that all other holy books, Bible, Vedas, Zendavis, etc., except the Holy Quran, is believed to be imaginary and untrue. But since these books I have reference of Prophet. Are they true? Please explain. The preaching that I explained in these holy books can be followed. As I mentioned in my talk, all the previous revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were meant only for a particular people and they were meant only for a particular time period. Since it was not meant for eternity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not guard these scriptures from corruption. But the Quran says in Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 9, that this is a book most honorable and we shall guard it from corruption. Since the Quran is for eternity, till Kayama, Allah will guard it from corruption. <clears throat> we believe that Torah is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Zabur is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Injil is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the present Bible is not the Injil which we believe in. The present Bible is a corruption of the word of God, of the word of prophet, of the word of historian, and even there is pornography in the Bible. Partly there is words of God, but totally is not the word of God, because Bible is not the original Injil. The Injil has been corrupted since it was time-bound. So to know which part of the Bible we can consider as word of God, we have to use the criteria, the Furqan, that the Holy Quran. Whatever matches with the Quran, we can, we can say, this we do not mind as accepting to be the word of God. But that does not mean that the whole book is the word of God. There is no other religious book except the Holy Quran, which is untouched and in the authentic form, and is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it true that all Muslims follow Muhammad, peace be upon him, enter heaven on the day of Qiyamah. All Muslims are followers of Islam, then what is the difference between Sunnis and Shia Muslims? Is it necessary to read the Quran in Arabic? The first question, all followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will enter Jannah? Yes, if they follow his teaching, practically, not only verbally. Just by saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you will not go to Jannah. You have to follow his teaching, the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith, then you go to Jannah. Otherwise not. All Muslims are followers of Islam, then what is the difference between Shia and Sunni? The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, it says that, Wa tasimu bihabdillahi jamiyaw, wala tafarraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Double emphasis. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly together and be not divided. What is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Holy Quran. The Holy Quran 
is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Muslims should hold to the Holy Quran. And the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, it says that anyone who makes division, anyone who breaks the religion and makes sex in the religion, his affairs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will tell him the truth. It is haram to divide the religion. Anyone who makes division in Islam, he is going against the Quran. <clears throat> so ask the Muslim, what are you? He will say, I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Shafi, I'm a Hanbali, I'm a Maliki, I'm a Shia, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Bori. What was the beloved Prophet? Was he a Shia? Was he a Sunni? Was he a Hanafi? Was he a Maliki? What was he? He was a Muslim. So if anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say you are a Muslim. The Holy Quran says that Isa alayhi salam in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, he was a Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 67, that Abraham alayhi salam, Abraham peace be upon him, was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. So if anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say you are a Muslim. The moment you say, I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Shafi, I'm a Shia, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Bori, I'm a Agha Khani, I'm a Barevli, I'm a Deobandi, you are going against the teaching of the Holy Quran. It is haram. You may agree with the explanation of Abu Hanifa, with the explanation of Imam Shafi. I've got no objection. You can agree with the explanation. But then anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say, I'm a Muslim. The moment you say anything besides Muslim, you are going against the Quran. Hope that answers the question. Is it necessary to read the Quran in Arabic? You come tomorrow for the lecture. Al Quran should it be read with understanding? The answer is given there, inshallah. Being a working woman and child and having need to look after parents, my own family, not able to perform five times prayer, Islam being a practical religion, what is the solution for my problem? Holy Quran or the Prophet saying? It is compulsory for every Muslim to offer salah, irrespective whether he's sick or whether he's traveling. If he's sick, if he can't stand the Quran, says, pray while sitting, pray while lying. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 100 and 203. If you can't, if you can't pray while sitting, lying, do with ishara, just with indication. It's fard. Except when a woman is undergoing the menstrual period, she has been given a concession or to offer salah. But if she goes out for any other work, etc., she has to offer salah. There is no work which prevents you from salah. I have been a medical doctor. Doctor's life is very busy. I can offer five times salah. These are excuses that people give. Only while traveling, Islam gives you a concession that you can shorten your salah. The four akat salah of Zohar, Asar, and Isha, you can cut down to two. And you can join the Zohar and Asar and the Maghrib and Isha. It's a concession. But if you're living in your hometown, you have to offer salah five times a day, minimum five times. It's compulsory, you have no excuse, irrespective of whether you're working or not. Being a Muslim, can we wear a tie? Tie is a symbol of Christianity or not? One of the criteria of hijab is that you cannot wear dress that which resembles to the unbelievers. I cannot wear a cross. It's a sign of Christianity. I cannot wear om. It's a sign of Hinduism. People say that tie is a sign of Christianity. Don't wear tie, don't wear shirt, wear kurta, don't wear coat. There is a group of people who say this. I am asking, is it mentioned in the Bible, tie, tie is a sign of Christianity? I have read the Bible. Show me which verse of the Bible say tie is a sign of Christianity. There is no verse. Tie is a cultural death. You can follow any culture as long as it doesn't go against the Sharia. The Western culture is to wear shorts. The women wear mini. It goes against the Sharia, so you cannot wear shorts and mini. But tie is a cultural dress. It doesn't go against the Sharia. You can adopt any culture which does not go against the Sharia. If you go, if you go in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, the Eskimos, they wear coats. You can't say this is not a sunnah dress. You can't wear. If you don't wear that, you'll die. People say that you should not wear shirt. See, the kurta that you wear, even that's a sign of cross. You put the sleeves apart, that's a sign of cross. Why do you wear kurta? Why do you wear? Even kurta is, a, kurta is more of a sign of cross. See, you put the sleeves like that, doesn't it look like a cross? It is. But is it mentioned in the Bible that kurta is a sign of cross? Is it mentioned shirt is a sign of cross? See, there are some Muslims, a group of Muslims, 
whatever the westerners do they object to it see what they do against islam you object fornication adultery object to that but what they don't do against the sharia unnecessary don't pick up things and you'll be shocked to know that the word kurta is not mentioned in the holy quran the word kameez is mentioned in the holy quran if you read surah yusuf chapter number 12 no less than five places verse number 18 verse number 24 verse number 25 verse number 26 it is mentioned about shirt the prophet yusuf alaihi salam wore a shirt the kameez is mentioned in the quran word kurta is not there so if i say i wear the shirt i am following more of the quran than you wearing the kurta the people get these ideas from where i don't know where does the hadith say that you cannot wear a tie where does it say it does say don't wear thing which resemble that of the unbelievers like a chain wearing a cross putting a verbin on sign of hinduism don't do that thing. otherwise any culture which doesn't go in the sharia you can follow <coughs> the prophecy which you mentioned <coughs> about a person who will be circumcised long beard etc even the first to jesus peace be upon him that the prophecy i mentioned that it i is quoting i quoted a prophecy in bhavishya purana that this prophecy can refer to jesus christ peace be upon him where does it refer are the followers of jesus christ keeping a beard is it mentioned in the bible keep a beard it says my follower will be a man who will keep a beard in all the muslims it is mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 780 and 781 which says it's not a fard keeping a beard is not a fard it's the sunna of a beloved prophet it says that do the opposite of what the pagans do cut the mustache short and let the beard grow it's not a fard it's the sunna of a beloved prophet it's not a sunna and the christians they don't keep a beard being circumcised it's mentioned i do agree that jesus gave a circumcised the christian should be circumcised but they aren't so these are only two points of the prophecy as compared to the 10 to 15 points i mentioned bhavishya purana parva 3 khand 3 adhyat 3 shloka 10 to 27 it also says that a malaycha a foreigner will come and he will be circumcised he will not have a tail he will sport a beard he will not eat the flesh of swine and because he fight the irreligious people he will be called as musliman are the christian called as musliman are the christian called as musliman do they give the call for salah do they give the adhan who gives the adhan the muslim to fulfill the complete prophecy it refers to no one but a beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him pa abdul karim to our planning muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had advised follow the quran and not to do research on other religious books why do we make research and instead convince the non muslims the greatness of islam in which hadith says the prophet said don't do research people quote a hadith in which hazrat umar may allah be pleased with him he was reading the injil and the prophet said don't read the injil the prophet said don't read the injil for guidance for guidance you should not read the injil but for doing dawa you have to read who says that not dr zakir quran says that quran says in surah al baqara chapter number 2 was the 111 it says wa qalu la yadkhulu jannata illa man kana hudan aw nasara the jews and christian they say you muslims you shall never enter jannah with your hajj with your fasting with your salah with the mark on your forehead you muslim you shall never enter jannah unless you become a jew or a christian allah says tilka amaniyuhum this is the wishful thinking bakwas hai bakwas when desires kul hatu bhanakum produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin but if you are truthful and they have produced the proof the holy bible in no less than 2000 different languages they say my bible says this my bible says that my bible says this my bible says that what do you have to do do you have to follow the bible hook line and thinker you have to read the bible analyze the bible and speak to them quran says in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 64 ta'ala ila qalmitin sawa'in bainan wa bainakum come to comment terms as between us and you how will you come to comment terms unless you don't read the religious scriptures so don't read the religious scriptures of the non muslim for guidance but read it for doing dawa and that's what the quran says and the prophet never forbid that non muslim say that allah gives rizq food to all the people it means we don't have to work we will get everything freely 
like manna salva for sun for his bride. What is the answer for this? Nowhere does the Quran say that you don't have to work. Quran says he is the Razak. He is the Rabb. He will give you sustain. But nowhere does the Quran say that you should not work. A beloved prophet said, trust in God, but tie your camel. That does not mean you leave the house open and then say, no robber will come. You have to follow the Quran, try your level best, do not be dishonest, you have to be honest, do not cheat, do not be corrupt. In spite of that, if you feel that you earn less, don't be bothered. Allah is the one to give risk. With all your intelligence, if Allah does not want to give you risk, does not want to give food, with all your intelligence, you cannot earn a single pie. So Allah says, follow the guidance of the Holy Quran, He will give you risk. But that does not mean Allah says, don't work. Allah says that you have to do righteous deeds. You should work in the right way. Don't be corrupt. Is it said that 1,24,000 prophets came to this world to guide the destiny of mankind? Only 25 names of prophets have been stated in the Quran. I want to know from you why the names of other prophets are not mentioned. I mentioned in the talk that the Quran mentions 25 prophets by name. If all the 1,24,000 names are to be mentioned and the stories, it will require a big encyclopedia. We Muslims don't have time to read this book. This Holy Quran is so small, it takes few hours, we don't have time to read this. Who will read that encyclopedia? See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has related the story of those prophets which is good as an example for you. Some may not be an example for you. The Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 164 and Surah Ghafir chapter number 40 verse number 78 we relate to you the story of some and of the others we don't. Those which are useful for you for guidance Allah relates the story. It's not necessary here to relate the full history of mankind from Adam and Islam to today. You will require a big tall skyscraper like Empire State Building to give the history of all the prophets. So whatever is important for you for guidance is given in the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith. As we are Muslim, we believe in that the Holy Quran is the message of Allah. There is no doubt, okay? Uh, but non-Muslim uh, non brothers, they doesn't believe the Holy Quran is the word of Allah. They need some proof, some evidence. What is the evidence you can give to them? The brother asked the question that how can you prove to the non-Muslim that Holy Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That calls for a big lecture, brother. I doubt the people are in the mood to listen to that. There is a video cassette available of mine. Is the Quran God? But I think it will be available outside. Those who want can acquire it. I don't know what the hadiya is. Is the Quran the word of God? It's a two part, part one, part two. And I've proved there scientifically that Quran is the word of God. I've proved to an atheist, to an Hindu, to a Christian that Quran is the word of God. For the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette. Is the Quran the word of God? I have dealt with the various types of people. Every individual requires a different style of argument. You can take that video cassette and view it. Inshallah, I'll get the answer. A small question. Yes, sir. Uh, my elders say that uh, touching the feet of uh, uh, elders, that is, uh, the who are elder in our age, touching their feet is a good thing. Touching the feet of elders is a custom in Hindus, we say. Brother asked a question. The Hindu friends say that touching the feet of the elders is a custom. Is it allowed or not? Is it allowed or not? See, as I said, you cannot bow down to anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot bow down to anyone. The Quran says that next to worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being kind to your parents. In Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, we have to respect our parents. But you cannot touch their feet. That, that means you're worshipping them. You cannot worship anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because your parents have given you birth. They have let you come physical in this world. But the main person who gives you risk, etc., is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is your creator. He is your sustainer. So if you have to thank anyone, you have to thank only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to ask your Hindu friend, who is greater, God Almighty or your parents? You have to ask them, who is greater? God Almighty. So if God Almighty is greater, you have to only worship God Almighty and no one else. You can respect them, you can obey them, alhamdulillah, but not worship them. Touching their feet and bowing to them means you're worshipping them, which is haram, which is shirk. Christians are said to perform miracles by the help of Jesus Christ. Is it true? How is it happen? And my second question is about the help of Mr. Ahmad Didar. The question poses, 
that the Christian friends say, you can do miracles with the help of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. How do you answer them? See, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 24, verse number 24. It says, for they shall arise many false Christs and false prophets, and they shall do wonders and miracles, and if it's possible, shall deceive the very elect. That means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, miracle is not the test. Doing miracle is not the test at all. For judging that you are a follower of Jesus Christ or not, peace be upon him, miracle is not the test. I do know there are miracle healing ceremony where people come in public, there are thousands of people, and the priest comes and says, the lame person starts walking, the blind person starts seeing, all these are fake, these are gimmicks. We have got video cassettes showing that the person who comes on the stage, he is planted by them only. He's planted by them. It's a fake. If miracle, if they can actually heal the people, I tell them, I'm a doctor, why don't you come to the hospital and heal the patient? 100% will convert to Christianity. 100%. Why are you going out in the public? Come to the hospital and treat the patient. 100% will accept Christianity. They say, no, no. Why? Because they are fake people. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel that when people will come to him, that, oh Lord and Master, we did wonders and miracles in your name. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will tell them that he Ye men of iniquity, you depart from here. I don't even know you. Jesus Christ will tell these people who do miracles, I don't even know you. Miracle is not the test. Miracle is not the test. If you say they do miracles, you are the Christian person to come to Bombay, and I know thousands of patients who are ill, all thousands will convert, 100%. Ask them to heal them. This is just making a mockery. And this mockery is there in most of the religions. You find in other religions also. So miracle is not the test. But if you want to argue with them, you have to quote them as mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, that if you have faith, you can do miracles. The people who believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they can do miracles, they can speak foreign language, and no poison can harm them. So you have to tell them, yes, potassium cyanide. Have it. If you say you can do miracles, according to the Bible, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, no poison can harm you. Give them potassium cyanide, and let's see whether they have it or not. That is the test, according to the Bible. Hope that answers the question. Non-Muslim friends ask me, you go to Mecca and do tawaf around the stone. The same thing also we do to our deity. How to explain to non-Muslim friends? Very good question. That some non-Muslims say, that you Muslims, you all are the biggest idol worshipper. The stone which is worshipped maximum in the world is the Kaaba. How do you reply to them? And they say, that all the Muslims, when you pray, you bow to the Kaaba. We have to tell them that no Muslims bow down to the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla, it's the direction. The Muslims, we believe in unity. When we have to offer Salah, we have to face in one direction. Suppose we have to offer Salah here. Some may say, let's face east. Some may say, let's pray towards the west. Some may say north, some may say south. There will be a confusion. For unanimous decision, for unity, all the Muslims in the world, they face towards the Kaaba. If they are in the south, they face the north. If they are in the east, they face the west. If they are in the west, they face the east. Kaaba is the Qibla. No Muslim worships the Kaaba. We face towards the Kaaba for unity, for unification. When we go for Hajj, we do the Tawaf around the Kaaba. We do the Tawaf around the Kaaba, we circumambulate because every circle has got one center, indicating that we believe in one God Almighty. We believe in Tawheed. We believe in unity. We do the Tawaf to again testify that there is one God Almighty. Every circle has got one center, it doesn't have two centers. Regarding do we worship the Kaaba, Hazrat Omar Mellabi pleased with him said that I am kissing the black stone, N not because it can benefit me, neither can it harm me. Just because the Prophet kissed, I am kissing it. Otherwise this black stone, it's a lifeless thing. It cannot harm me, neither can it benefit me. No Muslim worships the Sangha's word. No Muslim worship the Kaaba. And the best argument is to the Hindus that at times of the Prophet, the Muslims even stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. I want to ask which Hindu will stand on the statue of his God? Will they stand? No. The thing you worship will not stand on it. So, but naturally, this is enough proof that Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. Hope that answers the question. How to make Christians understand? that Isa a.s. is not son of God. What are the proof we can give for this matter? What you have to say is, there is no unequivocal statement 
in the whole bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says he is god of worship if any christian can show me any unequivocal statement anywhere in the bible where jesus christ himself says he is god or he says worship me i am ready to accept christianity just now i am not speaking on behalf of the other muslims i am putting my head on the guillotine there is not a single unequivocal statement in the whole bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says that is god in fact he said it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 14 verse number 28 my father is greater than i in the gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 29 my father is greater than all in the gospel of john chapter number 5 verse number 30 i can of my own self do nothing in the gospel of luke chapter number 11 verse number 20 says I cast out devils by the finger of God. He never claimed divinity. Regarding son of God, Bible has got sons by the tongue. David is the son of God. Isaac is the son of God. Anyone who follows the teaching of God, they are children of God. But they say no no no, Jesus Christ is not a plain son. He is the begotten son of God. And they quote Gospel of John chapter number 3 verse number 16 which says, "For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son whosoever shall believe in believe in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life do you know this word begotten from the latest revised standard edition of the bible rsv it has been removed as an interpolation revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 different corporate denominations the revised standard version goes closer to the authentic source of the bible and they say that this word begotten is an interpolation it should not be there in the bible it's a fabrication so nowhere did jesus christ peace be upon him claim divinity in fact he said my father is greater than i my father is greater than all i can of my own self do nothing he never claim divinity many feel and believe that prophet muhammad peace be upon him was a philosopher who learning through who learning through abu talib may allah be pleased with him all surplus and concocted quran which may have been similar to the bible of the torah people say that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wrote the quran and he copied from the bible and again this answer i have given in the cassette is the quran god's word where i prove that he has not copied it and if anyone says that if he has copied why didn't he copy the scientific error mentioned the bible there are several scientific errors in genesis chapter number 1 which says that the earth was created on third day sun on the fourth day why did the prophet copy that it says that vegetable kingdom came first then came the sun it's unscientific it speaks about the universe being created in 624 days why didn't the prophet copy that did he know science in which he said no this is unscientific and he copied the other thing on the face of it it looks similar but the quran and the bible is the difference of chalk and cheese zameen aasman ka farak hai for the complete answer refer to my video cassette is the quran god's word in quran allah says that any sacrifice any sacrifice forbidden is haram if some other name is taken means if any sacrifice on any other name besides allah is taken in haram any eatable given or prasad whether it can be taken by muslims or not yes the quran says in no less than four different places in surah al baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173 in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 3 in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 145 and surah nahl chapter number 16 verse number 115 it says hurramat alaykumul maytatu wad damu wa lahmil khinzir wa ma uhilla li ghayr allah bi that is forbidden for you for food ah dead meat blood the flesh of swine and any food on which any name besides allah has been taken it's haram for you if you take any name besides allah even if you take the name of the prophet on that food that food is haram for you you cannot take any name besides allah and if anyone serves you prasad can a muslim have it no it is haram you can't have it it is haram it's going against the teaching of the quran how to deal with such people refer to my video ka said dawa or destruction this has nothing to do with this uh, subject Huh. but what about uh, there is a question of organ donation human organ donation is it permissible during lifetime and after death 
Rida, the question is organ donation permissible during lifetime or during death? There's no verse in the Holy Quran which says that you should donate the organ or you should not donate. Neither is there any reference in the Sahih Hadith. Therefore, there was a conference of the ulama in Malaysia several years ago. There was a conference of all the ulama in Malaysia and they passed a resolution, they passed a fatwa that organ donation, organ transplantation is allowed under certain circumstances. Firstly, when you donate that organ, it should not cause damage to your life. For example, today medical science tells us one kidney is sufficient for a person to survive. If I have got two kidneys and if my mother has kidney failure, if I donate one kidney to my mother, surely Allah will not hold me responsible. Because my care is in the jannah. Paradise is beneath the feet of my mother. But when I'm donating one of my kidney, yet I can lead a healthy life. I can't donate my heart saying my mother has a heart problem. The moment I donate my heart, I will die myself. So the first criteria is, when you donate any organ, it should not cause a risk to your life. Point number one. It should not be done for economic reasons, for gaining money. I donate my kidney, I get two lakh rupees. It's haram. It should be done to save the life of any other human being. Three criteria are there. But natural, when he's alive. When he's dead, you can give certain parts of your body. For example, if it's helpful to save other people's life. If a person says, I do not mind giving certain parts of your body, it can be done again, not for reasons of money, and it should be to save someone else's life. And even this fatwa has been passed in India. There are ulama who have sat together and discussed this and said that organ donation is allowed, but it should not be done for money and should not cause a danger for your life if you are alive. Hope that answers the question. Jesus says in a place in the Bible, I and my father are one. Please explain. The question poses, one place Jesus says, I and my father are one. The reference is not given. The reference you are quoting is from John chapter number 10, verse number 30, which Jesus Christ does say, I and my father are one. And the Christians say, because Jesus Christ said, I and my father are one, he is claiming divinity. You ask the Christian, what is the context? Like how the brother said, lakum dinukum waliyadin, out of context. Similarly, the Christian pose out of context, I and my father are one. For the complete context, you have to go to verse number 23. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 20 to 23, 24 onwards, it says that Jesus Christ entered the, the porch of the Temple of Solomon. All the Jews surrounded him and they said that if thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. He said, I have told you plainly, but you do not understand me. My sheep hear my voice, they follow me, and I give them eternal life. My Father has given the sheep to me. No man can pluck them out of my hand. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. The context is, no man can pluck the followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, from his hand. No man can pluck them out of the father's hand. I and my father are one. I and my father are one here means one in purpose. Suppose my father and my father is a doctor, I am a doctor. If I say I and my father are one, means I and my father are one in profession, in the medical profession. That does not mean I and my father are one human being. We are different. We have a different personality. And then the verse says, John chapter 10 verse number 29 says, My father is greater than all. I and my father are one. Verse number 30. Gospel of John chapter number 10 verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. And if you read further it says, that the Jews picked up stone to throw at the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that for which of my works do you stone me? So the Jews said, we stone you because you blaspheme. So Jesus Christ said, it is mentioned in your scriptures that whoever follows the commandment of God, they are called as God and the law is not broken. So this proves that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity because the same one is used somewhere else in the Gospel of John. It says that my father is in me, I am in the disciples, the twelve disciples, we are one. Does it mean that there are 13, 14 gods? Does it mean? If you say, I and my father are one, means Jesus Christ is also God. You also have to, also have to agree that all the 12 disciples are also God Almighty. Surely it means that God Almighty and Jesus Christ are one in purpose. The last question is, right in the Bible or Quran, why great importance has been given to Jews and their brethren Arabs, only as all people in the world are equal? All messengers delivered are only from Egypt and the surroundings. Why not from other parts of the world? The question posed asks that why are the messengers sent only to Egypt and the people? Why not to other parts of the world? As I mentioned, the Quran clearly says in 
Surah Fatih chapter 35 verse 24, Wa im min ummatin illa khalafihan nazeel. There's not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a honor or a guide. They were sent to throughout the world. But more of the stories of Jews and Christians are related because the Quran was revealed in Arabia and they were surrounded by Jews and Christians. So to get them closer to Islam, they are narrated the stories of those people, not of the other prophets. As the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 164, that we narrate the story of some of the prophets, the others we don't. That does not mean prophets were not sent to the other people. They were sent. And all the prophets were no Jews. They were Arab prophets also. Salih alayhi salam. He was an Arab. But I do agree that many examples given in the Holy Quran are the examples of Jews. Because more Jews and Christians were surrounding that area. So to speak with them, example has to be given of their scriptures. Hope that answers the question. I believe this was the last question. Waakharu Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Before we conclude this meeting, it is my proud privilege to propose a hearty word of thanks. At the outset, I'm sure every one of us here had a feast for our ears with a lecture of Dr. Zakir Naik. I wholeheartedly thank him on behalf of the association for having made it convenient to come all the way from Bombay. And uh, presumably, this is his maiden speech at Madras. And definitely every one of us enjoyed his lecture. I thank you, sir, for your lecture. And if we had this excellent program today, it was made it possible only by our president, Janab Hashim Saab, who was instrumental in bringing Dr. Zakir Naik here for the lecture. And I thank him for his presence here and for being instrumental in arranging this lecture. I thank our secretary, Janab Khalilullah Sahab, and particularly our assistant secretary, religious affairs, Janab Malik Sahab, who solely made every minute arrangement for making this function a success. We were overwhelmed by the jam-packed audience in this auditorium, and but for you, our honored guest, this celebration would not have been a memorable one, and I thank everyone and all those who were instrumental in making this a memorable function. Thank you.